Hi, let, let's get started. Um, welcome back. This is, uh, I'm Florencia Marota Wergler. I am the co-director of the Burman Women's Leadership Network. And, um, and welcome to the um, salary negotiation panel, which I will be uh, moderating. So um, earlier this morning, we, we received some sobering facts about uh, the, the disparities uh, between uh, genders. And an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, finding was that as, uh, as, as um, the careers of individuals progress, as, as one becomes more senior, the, the gap increases more and more. And, uh, and one of the reasons behind it, maybe, could be that usually when uh, people get hired, there's an established salary, there's a, 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 a particular scale or a lockstep, at, at least in, in academic environments, there's a particular entry salary. But, but as, uh, as, as careers progress, sometimes uh, it, it's up to the individual and up to the, the, the institution and the individual to negotiate for higher pay. So one possible reason for the, that might explain a, a larger disparity among other, many other things is the ability to negotiate and, and advocate for yourself and to understand what the dynamics are when these conversations happen. And, and our hope with this panel, which I'll introduce in a, in, a, in a second, is to talk about the state of the research regarding how um, uh, negotiation happens, whether, what, what type of gender differences do we observe, but also to, to have a more practical approach where we can understand, uh, given the research, what might be the tools that might help uh, for more effective, to, to create more effective uh, negotiations. So uh, the, the panel consists of um, Jamie, uh, Jamie Lee, and um, so she's a leadership and negotiation coach who helps ambitious people become bolder, braver, and better paid through powerful mindset shifts. Um, born in South Korea, Jamie first learned the value of speaking up from the example of her mother who single-handedly raised three daughters while running a small business as an immigrant in America. Jamie calls herself a pragmatic negotiation geek and relentless optimist. She has led hundreds of workshops on mutual win negotiation strategies, self-advocacy, a transformative leadership of, um, of the UN's Commission on the Status of Women, J.P. Morgan Chase, Essence Digital, Fletcher School of Diplomacy, um, and more. Uh, next, uh, we have uh, Julia, uh, Julia uh, Baer. So um, Julia is an associate professor in the College of Business at Stony Brook University. Her research focuses on the influence of gender on negotiation and conflict management, as well as on Im investigating the underlying causes of gender gaps in organizations. Dr. Baer's research has uh, been published in many leading management and psychology journals and book. Uh, she's also the recipient of multiple Best Paper Awards from the Academy of Management and the International Association of Conflict Management, as well as a Fulbright Fellowship and Marie Curie um, Fellowship. Um, uh, next, uh, we have uh, Claire uh, Wasserman, who is the founder of Ladies Get Paid, a career development organization dedicated to helping women negotiate for pay, for pay and power in the workplace. In just over two years, Ladies Get Paid has grown to 30,000 members from all 50 sa states and more than 100 countries. Um, it's free to join <laughs> at ladiesgetpaid.com. Oh. Um, that was my handwriting. It was very no, bad. No, no. <laughs> Your handwriting, my, my, my vision. Yeah. Um, and, then, and next, uh, finally, we have uh, Lisa Leslie, who's an associate professor of management and organization at the Stern School of Business. She received her uh, AB in social psychology from Princeton University and her MA and PhD in organizational psychology from the University of Maryland. Uh, prior to joining Stern in 2013, she spent six years as an assistant professor at the Crosland School of Management in the University of Minnesota. Uh, Professor Leslie's research focuses on diversity organizations and specifically understanding why in organizational diversity initiatives often produce unintended consequences, both positive and negative. She also has a secondary research interest in cross-cultural organizational behavior and, the com and conflict management. Professor Leslie has received many awards for her research, what, and, uh, which has appeared in a number of top journals spanning a number of different um, disciplines. Uh, so uh, I will, each, each, uh, each panelist will speak for about five to seven minutes, then I'll, uh, we'll have a conversation, and then we'll open it up uh, for questions. So um, do, you want, do you would like to start? So um, I work primarily with women, about 
8% of my clientele are women. And what I have found to be most useful for me, you know, I was my first client, was seeing examples of other women negotiate for what they want. And that's why I mentioned my mother, who as I was growing up uh, in New Jersey as a fresh off the plane uh, immigrant kid. And she would always say, Jamie, you gotta speak up. You gotta ask for what you want. You gotta be sassy. Tell them what you want. And I used to hate it because I was just wanted to be a nice girl, liked by everyone else. I didn't wanna be that bossy, sassy girl. And then I entered the working force and I found out that she was absolutely right. You gotta ask for what you want. You don't get what you think you deserve. You don't get what you do deserve. You get what you ask for. And I learned um, this valuable lesson the hard way, of course. I worked in finance about 10 years ago and I found out that I was making 50% of the going market rate a year into my job. And I had made all the classic mistakes. I did not network. I didn't reach out to my Smith College alumni network and ask for advice about what it's like to work in finance. I didn't go find out from other people what other hedge fund analysts make. I didn't think about what my employer would want from me. What would they want to hear from me? What future vision do I have for this role? What additional value can I offer them? No, I was in a transactional mindset. I thought, I'm gonna bring me and my skill sets and my degree and I'm gonna do the work and I'm gonna get paid for the work that I do. You know, effort plus time equals money. I had a transactional mindset. I had a fixed mindset about the money that I could earn. And I also didn't really study what it is to bring a collaborative negotiation mindset to the conversation. So what I did was I read an online article that said, hey, you got an offer? Just go back and ask if they are willing to negotiate. Is there room for improvement? That's how you negotiate, ask for more. I'm like, oh, okay, I can do that. So I got an offer, which was basically my minimum requirement for the role. They asked me, what is your minimum requirement? My minimum requirement became the starting salary. And when I asked, okay, is there room for negotiation? There was a flat out no. And I, of course, didn't know how to negotiate at the time. So I just, well, okay, I'm just going to take the role. I'm just going to do it. And that's how I ended up making $50,000 in a $100,000 job. And uh, that was a great experience for me. That was the best learning experience for me. You can say that I was a victim of the gender wage gap, and now I'm in the business of making the gender wage gap irrelevant for women because now we know what, we've done, what I've done wrong. Now I know how it can be better, and now I'm in the business of helping other women do it better for themselves. And uh, the tools that I often share with, I always share, with my workshop attendees, with my coaching clients, is bring a future focus. Number one, bring a future focus. Let's think about the gender wage gap. We've had the wage gap for what? About 40 years now, uh, 50 years since women were officially allowed to enter the workforce in the middle of the 20th century. It's a very, when you consider the lifespan of the entire human species, it's a very recent phenomenon. And when we keep just focusing on the fact that we have a gender wage gap and we are the victims of gender wage gap, we will perpetuate the, the gender wage gap. But when we create a future focus where the gender wage gap does not exist, and according to feminist activist Gloria Steinem, if the wage gap were to be closed across all sectors, that would add $200 billion into the economy. And think about what your piece of $200 billion could be. And I've asked this question to a group of 500 women who work in the nuclear industry and it's male dominated industry. And I asked, okay, do you think your take home pay would be 1,600, you know, basically 200 billion divided by 200 million women in the, or 100 million women in the United States? People raised their hands. Do you think it would be 32,000? More people raised their hands. Well, how about you know, the fact that some uh, academics, some scholars say that uh, some women lose up to a half a million dollars in the lifetime 
because they don't negotiate. And one brave soul raised her hand. She said, yep, that's me. My take home pay, if the gender wage gap closed across all sectors, would be $200 billion, would be $500,000 for me. Did I make sense in that sentence? Okay. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to bring here is we have to bring a new mindset when we think about women, when we think about the value of our work, when we think about how to negotiate, we think about the, <coughs> the additional future value we bring. And, and this is the mind-blowing thing. The future does not exist except in our own minds. We get to create it. Nothing limits it except for our imagination. It can be whatever we want it to be. And I want it to be one where the, the gender wage gap is irrelevant. Victimhood does not exist. We are all equals. And so we, we can create that in our own mind. And we can create that in our own mind. We can articulate it. And when we articulate that future vision, we can motivate ourselves to negotiate like the leaders that we are. So I think future focus is super important. I think curiosity is important. I think creativity is important. And I think these are all qualities that we have within us that is possible for every one of us. So that's what I have to share about that. Thank you. Okay, okay thank you. Um, so. Um, uh, it's interesting, so Jamie was talking about the future. Um, I'm actually gonna talk a bit about the past uh, because um, the Lilly Ledbetter, uh, both the Supreme Court case and the, the act of legislation that Obama signed into office in 2008, um, in many ways really paralleled uh, the research on gender negotiation, uh, meaning that the research on gender negotiation has really just blossomed in the past 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and so I do want to share a bit, um, again, I am a, a researcher, so I'll share a bit from a, a research perspective, uh, what we know um, and where it's going. So we do know that these gender gaps exist. We have a great deal of empirical evidence about them. We have many studies. We even now have what are called meta-analyses, studies of studies, um, showing that basically uh, men are more likely than women to first of all <laughs> view issues as negotiable in the first place. Um, second of all, to initiate a negotiation over those issues. Um, third of all, to um, obtain the outcome that they want um, in the negotiation. And fourth, men tend to be viewed more positively um, w when they negotiate. So we do know that those gaps exist. Um, you know, they're not huge, they're, they're statistically significant, they're not huge effects, but, but they do exist. Um, so in terms of sort of giving you a sense of all that research in the next couple minutes, I just want to uh, highlight three major points. The first point I would highlight in terms of uh, this research is it depends. So what that means is, yes, we see gender gaps in negotiation, but there are also a variety of situations under which they disappear. So we know that uh, when men and women negotiate for someone else, they actually negotiate equally well. And in my research, I actually found that even if they just imagine that they're gonna negotiate for someone else, but then they go out and negotiate for themselves, that helps as well, and then they perform equally well. Um, we also know that when situations are transparent, so people have information, they have information about the bargaining zone, about salary ranges, about is it considered normative or acceptable to negotiate, uh, we know that gender gaps um, tend to disappear. So it, we do have these gaps, but I think the good news, quote unquote, is that they're not exactly written in stone. They do, it does depend um, on the situation. Um, the next highlight I wanted to share with you about the research is backlash. Um, this sort of classic catch-22 um, that you're probably familiar with, right? So when women are assertive, um, they're disliked. When they're not assertive, they're liked, but they don't get what they want. Um, and so we do know in the research that this is true for negotiation as well, but it's complicated. So we know that when men and women negotiate, um, men are viewed more favorably than women. Um, we also know, and this really speaks to your experience, that when men and women negotiate, men are actually more likely to get what they ask for. So in fact, there's, there's, some really, there's some recent studies showing, in fact, that more recently, men and women are actually asking at equal rates um, but men are simply more likely to get what they ask for um, than women. So I consider that, I would call that economic backlash, right? So it's not about do I like you, it's you know, do I give you what you want. Um, on the other hand, um, 
I, I recently uh, ran a study where we tested a, a negotiation script. We had men and women negotiate assertively, but very, very politely, and we didn't find any evidence for backlash. So I think you know this sort of assertive, coupled with polite approach, um, can be very useful when it comes to this backlash issue. Um, and then the third point I, I'd like to make, and this also I think speaks to some of the points that Jamie was talking about in her experiences, um, is that I think we really need to think about negotiating not just salary. Salary matters, of course, a great deal, and we know that even you know small amounts of money initially compound through the course of one's career. Uh, you know, raises are based on the previous salary, so I'm not saying nego salary negotiation doesn't matter, but I do think we need to think about negotiating career issues generally. Um, in fact, if you look at the gaps um, at top management between men and women in terms of positions held, things like that, they're actually huge. They're much larger than even the gender wage gap. I mean, it's really phenomenal when you look at, you know, at, you know sort of top management CEO level in terms of who who's in those positions. Um, and I found in my research that among very successful men and women, they're constantly negotiating their careers, whether it be their workload, their tasks, their role, their career development, in me, and in many ways, much more frequently uh, than negotiating salary. Because we don't, you know, salary negotiations happen, but they're not, you know, on a weekly or monthly basis. So um, I would really, um, you know, urge, you know, sort of broadening how we think about salary negotiation. It really is inextricable to career negotiation. Um, but I would just make one final point, um, which is that, <clears throat> uh, you know, the, the, there, there obviously are there depressing, so to speak, dismal elements um, about this whole issue. But um, I will say, uh, you know, when I, so I started my PhD around 2005 uh, with a woman named Linda Babcock. She's a professor at Carnegie Mellon. She wrote a book called Women Don't Ask. Uh, you may have heard of that book. And so when I started working with her, uh, her book had just come out. Um, there wasn't a lot of research about gender negotiation. There was some. Um, you know, when people would ask me, oh, what are you doing your PhD on, your dissertation on, I would, you know, give them my little spiel. You know, maybe they were interested, maybe not. They'd kind of look at me blankly. Oh, gender negotiation. Oh, okay. You know, um, whereas today, um, it has really, I mean, there's a whole consciousness about this issue. When I tell people what I study, everybody, you know, knows about it. I mean, we have, you know, you know, companies, you know, formed around this issue. I think there's, there, it's really much more in the public consciousness. And I think that really is thanks to, again, the Lily Ledbetter case, uh, the Lily Ledbetter Fair Pay Act, and then, of course, you know, all the research um, that, um, that we are all, uh, you know, doing. So I, you know, I know that things are um, not great, but I also think historically, um, I, I do think there's a consciousness around this issue, and hopefully that will seep into the employer side um, that that wasn't there, let's say, 10, 15, you know, 15 years ago. So thank you. Sure, Claire. When you mentioned that there are whole companies and movements <laughs> around it, so I just I just want to say before I started Ladies Get Paid, um, I had just been doing a lot of research uh, around not the gender wage gap, but just more general inequalities, right, in the workplace. And then I got hooked on the gender wage gap. And you read these dismal statistics, and you get very depressed, which I was depressed for about a year. <laughs> a really good therapist if you're looking for recommendations. So, uh, and then I had this realization, right, it's like, well, what can I possibly do? How could you combat something that's so systemic? And that's where the depressing part comes. And then I had this realization that if I got a raise, and you got a raise, and you got a raise, then collectively, we are moving the needle, or at least feeling like we have agency to close the wage gap. Um, of course, we need our governments to do the right thing, we need our companies to do the right thing, but at least I can have a say in how much I make. And I realized also that I had never asked for a raise because I assumed my employer was being fair. And of course, they were being fair, right? It was commensurate with the market rate, but I, I could have gotten a little bit more. They would have given it to me, right? Um, so I just want to mention, out of the 30,000 women that we have in our community, salary negotiation is by far the number one challenge that these women cite. Um, and I think they think it's a lot more complicated than it actually is. Uh, but what, as, as we've dug into it and created our own curriculum, we've actually realized that the issue is not so much figuring out how much to charge, right? Because you can do research, right? It's actually making the case for why you're a top performer. That was the sticking point. 
because these women feel like either they, they don't, they're afraid they're going to be disliked, right? They might lose the opportunity. They might disrupt. Um, they feel like, well, doing the hard work, keeping your head down. Well, shouldn't you be getting a raise? Any, like I did the work. Doesn't that speak for itself? No, you have to speak for the work also. Uh, obviously, you know, a lot of these women struggle with not feeling like they deserve it. And that's the most heartbreaking part. Um, they also are ambitious, right? So they're thinking ahead of what they want to do. They're thinking of what they could have done better. So they start to kind of justify why what they get is what they're worth. Um, and then the other sad part is that we've had a lot of women write in and say this. They're afraid that if they get the raise, that they will not be able to live up to their own hype also. So that, you know, so again, I got depressed starting this. Now I'm like really depressed reading this stuff. And, and then what we've done, and this is what I'm going to be sharing with you all today, is how do you make an effective case for why you're a top performer? Because that's the thing, you can come in and show the research, but if you can't tie that to what you've done and how it's affected the company, then, you know, you're not going to get a raise just because you deserve it, even though we know you deserve it. No, you're going to get that raise because you've shown them that you are a top performer, so you should get the top dollar. Uh, and that's a lot easier said than done, right? There, there's the uh, kind of like psychological component of feeling confident enough to tell the story, and then there's the actual telling of the story, because you do need to be strategic in not just what you talk about, but you know, you gotta bring them on a journey. It's not just saying, well, I did this thing, no. We, we do this, uh, and you might know this, the, the STAR method. I don't know if Linda Babcock writes about this in her book at all. Uh, so this is a structure in which you can tell your story. Um, so S, you set the scene, right? give context. Uh, T is task. What, were you, what, what did you do? This is all very simple. A is action, and then R is result. And that can get a little bit tricky depending on what you do because you really should quantify your result. You should quantify your impact. Um, and, and this, you know, the reason I say this structure is because, again, you have to bring them almost like you have to make it compelling, like you're writing a screenplay and you're the main character. And by the end of it, we're so invested in you, we're going to actually invest in you. Uh, and so that's part of it, is telling the story. Now, of course, then the other part is, well, what do I even talk about? Uh, and so my suggestion is always look at what the original job description was and then write a new job description based on what you actually did. So if you're hiring somebody to replace you, right, what would you tell them about? You compare those two job descriptions, and you may even be surprised at how the scope radically changed. Right? I cannot believe I did this much. Right? Maybe you created what was self-motivated, what was unexpected that you did. You know, maybe you took on jobs of multiple people. By the way, there's, if they give you a substantial raise, that's still going to be less than if they had to pay another person to help you and benefit. So keep that in mind. Uh, and then the other thing I would suggest when you think about what um, things that you've done that you want to talk about, I would say challenges that you were given, right? No budget, no time, right? No, you know, maybe no project management tool. And if you achieve something and you did it, again, in this sort of unexpected, compelling way, then you should talk about it. Um, one thing I would mention is filter all of this through what you're really proud of and what do you actually want to do? Because if you talk about how you created this great Excel spreadsheet and it had a big impact on the company and that's fabulous, but you hated it and you don't want to do it moving forward, don't mention it because basically you say, oh, I did this great spreadsheet. That's you raising your hand saying, I want to do more of this. So remember that as well. Um, and then, you know, the last thing I would say is don't forget what we call superpowers. So this I know is in Linda Babcock's book, which is, I think it is, you'll correct me if I'm wrong, but inalienable powers is the kind of academic term for it. Uh, and this is basically what makes you you. So it's a little bit more of the EQ. If you're positive, enthusiastic, detail-oriented, you know, it's basically how do you actually do your job, not just what the job was. And that can be hard because we're sort of too close to ourselves. Um, so as you think about what makes you you and how you affect your team, I would ask your team. Ask, and, and also, if you tell them that you're trying to figure out how to make the best case possible to negotiate your salary, that's inspiring them. They should do the same thing, and they should talk to you about it. Like, you, it's not illegal. I don't think it is, right? You're the lawyers, you know. Uh, you know so, so, start, so in this whole process of figuring out uh, how much to charge and how to make an effective case, you should absolutely be sharing this with other people, and particularly women. Um, and, and then I guess sort of the, the last thing that I would say is um, just, again, please, please share. I would share how much you make. I mean, this stuff is only taboo because we've been told that it's taboo. 
Um, and this is just an exchange for goods and services. This is like anything else. You're the product, right? You're a business and you're asking for, for investment. So just even if you're feeling nervous about it and sharing, that's exactly why you should share it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, so lots of great points so far. I think what I, I want to try to do is sort of build on what's been said so far and maybe uh, hopefully integrate it a little bit. And what I really want to talk about is effective ways to frame a salary negotiation, right? So what is that first one or two sentences out of your mouth, right, when you sit down with your boss or whoever else to try to, to, try to engage in this negotiation? And I want to broaden the conversation a little bit and talk more generally about persuasion, right? Because that's what a salary negotiation is. You're trying to persuade the other party that you deserve uh, more money than they're currently offering you. So what this research on persuasion tells us, I'm an, an academic like, like Julia, this is my, my orientation as well, is that when we try to persuade other people, what our intuition is, what our gut is, is we want to sit them down and we want to give them the data, the logic, and the facts. Right? So here is this 70 slide PowerPoint presentation on why I deserve more money and exactly why I deserve that money. To Claire's point, you absolutely have to do that. You have to make the case. But the problem is that's not where you want to start. Right? If you sit down and you start there, what happens is the other person just shuts down. Right? They're unlikely to listen to you. They don't really have a great reason to listen to you. So before you do that, you have to frame the conversation in the right way. They're going to want to hear what you have to say. They're going to want to understand why it is that you deserve more money. Um, so the research on persuasion tells us there are three things you can do to get people to listen to you, right? to get them to listen to your, your PowerPoint presentation. And the first of these is to frame for common ground. Right? So basically this means help the person understand why giving you a raise is not only in your best interest, but it's in the best interest of the company, right? It's the best interest of everyone else. Uh, you need to establish your credibility, right? Help people understand that you're not just out for your own self-interest, you're really a trustworthy person, you're a competent person, um, you have other people's interests at heart. And then the third thing you want to do is use emotion. Now this does not mean be emotional. I would not recommend sitting down and crying, right? It's not a good place to start if you're trying to ask for more money. Uh, what this means is trying to pull on other people's emotions, right? Try to get them to feel something so they're more likely to listen to you. So that sounds like a lot, right? You have to think about common ground, you have to think about credibility, you have to think about emotions. But it's actually pretty simple and you can do it in just a couple of sentences. So let me give you an example. You're sitting down with a salary negotiation with your boss and you might start by saying, you know, look, I know this company, like we're the kind of people we really care about fairness and equity because paying people fairly is good for everybody. It increases their motivation, increases their performance. So when I realized that there might be a discrepancy with my salary, you know, I thought the thing that just made sense was for me to come talk to you about it. Could we have a conversation about it? Right? So that's just a couple sentences, and what you do with that is you frame for common ground, right? Fair pay system is good for everybody. It's good for motivation, it's good for performance. You've also established your credibility, right? This is not this self-interested thing, like I care about fairness. Everybody cares about fairness, right? That's a universal moral type principle. And you've, you've hopefully evoked some emotion, right? Because now you've put the other party, you put your boss in this position where they're thinking, okay, I as a person care about fairness. Oh, and they're suggesting that maybe, maybe I'm not being quite fair, right? That's gonna get some emotional arousal from the, from the person as well. Um, so to kind of to take this, this idea and link it back to some of what uh, Julie was talking about around you know, gender negotiation and particularly these backlash uh, effects, to put it really simply, what tends to happen is people have these you know, unfair stereotypic expectations that men are you know, agentic and aggressive and self-focused, whereas women are supposed to be you know, warm and nurturing and caring and other focused. And so the dilemma that women face is that negotiation over salary and other things is inherently this agentic act. Right? You're asking for something, you're being aggressive and assertive about it, and people don't like that because it violates their expectations. So the trick is, how do you do that? How do you be agentic? How do you ask for something without violating people's expectations? And the trick is that you have to do it in a nice, warm, communal way. Um, so the research Julie was talking about, one way to do that is to negotiate on behalf of other people. That's great, but it's not particularly pragmatic when it comes to salary negotiation. So what it means is you can ask for raises for your friends, right? But you can't ask for raises for yourself. You have to get your friend to do it or, or something along that. Um, but even though this more general advice around persuasion uh, is, you know, kind of more general advice, I, I think there's a case to be made that is also particularly effective for women. So you just do a little bit of a thought experiment and you think about sitting at the negotiation table as, as a woman and saying, on the one hand, you know, you're not paying me enough. I need more money. Right? That sounds very agentic and aggressive and, and self-focused. Versus saying, look, hey, we all care about, about fairness. Right? It's good for everybody. You know, is there something you can do here? That sounds much warmer and nicer right? and kind of um, more fitting with people's expectations. Um, so the last thing I want to I wanna say about this is that giving this kind of advice always makes me a little bit uncomfortable. Because what it basically means is that when it comes to negotiation, 
Women have fewer options, right? There's this very narrow kind of prescribed way that you should act in order to be successful. You have to kind of convey your warmth uh, and your communality while asking for things. And that's, that's really unfair, right? Whereas men have, men have this kind of wider range. Um, but at the same time, that's kind of the reality of the world that we live in. Um, and so until we wait for the world to catch up and change, I think there's some pragmatic value in kind of thinking about, you know, even though it's more equitable, even though it's more unfair, um, sort of little things you can do in terms of framing the conversation um, that could have a big impact. Thank you. So, so lots of interesting insights. So my, my first question is, um, so we've heard uh, uh, different types of, of very helpful advice based on research and experience. So, so sometimes the advice seems to be um, you have to have a focused approach to so this uh, star, you know, set the scene, what type of value do you, uh, do, do you add, what, what, type of, uh, what, what type of thing did you do, and then, and then do your ask to a broader one, which is uh, bringing issues of fairness and, and, and we can discuss as to you know to what extent we can be broad or narrow um, and but one practical question uh, is um, so you're sitting at the negotiating table and you use your preferred strategy and um, and the person with whom you're negotiating says no so what then <laughs> oh I love this question <laughs> no is when the negotiation starts okay <laughs> So my definition of negotiation is simply a conversation. It's just a talk with the intention of reaching agreement where everyone has the right to say no. And how old were you when you were first able to say that dreaded word, no? Two, some people are very fast growers, like <laughs> one, right? So subtract two from your current age, that's how long you have been negotiating. You are negotiators. You have the ability to say no. You have the ability to engage in conversations. You have the ability to hold the intention of reaching agreement. You are all negotiators. We just don't like to call it that because it's a big Latin word. And it makes us think of hagglers in the street market. So no is baked into the definition of negotiation. We all have the right, we all respect people's autonomy, their right to make decisions for themselves. No begins the negotiation. So embrace it. Let people say no to you. The more you're willing to hear and say no, the more comfortable you become with the word no, the more unstoppable you will be as a negotiator. So when people say no, don't get furious. They're just, ex they're just you know, exercising their own right to say no. Get curious. Uh, form a W with your mouth. This is a, um, uh, something that my mentor, Lisa Gates, of She Negotiates taught me. When people say no, just ask an open-ended diagnostic question. Get curious. I'm just curious. You know, what's behind your no? Where are you coming from? If this is a number that does not work for you, how did you get to this number? Do we need to bring somebody else into this conversation? Who can that be? If this is not a good time for you to make this, de this decision, when would be a good time to make this decision? I, I led a negotiation workshop for women lawyers who work as corporate counsels, and this was the key skill that surprised a lot of the lawyers because as lawyers, they were trained to ask leading questions, yes or no questions, right? I'm trying to lead you to a logical conclusion that I have already arrived to, so I'm just trying to shape your thinking to where I wanna go. Instead, don't do that. Open it up. Just get curious. Step into their world. Why are they saying no? Maybe there are hidden uh, uh, constraints that you don't know about. There are unknowns that you didn't know about. Get curious. Ask an open-ended question. So I did a workshop for engineers, and uh, one of the participants, he used this strategy uh, very skillfully. Turned out he was the man, but <laughs> I don't think that this is indicative of you know, men and women. I think this is something that all people can do. Uh, he uh, role played the scenario where he was told no, he cannot get a raise and a promotion. So he asked the question, okay, so what can I do to be ready for that promotion? And the person that he was role playing with said, well, you know, you can take these um, additional courses and trainings, but in the meantime, maybe you can uh, step into the role of assistant manager. He said, okay, great, I would love to do that. 
what is the salary associated with the title of assistant manager? And the person said, okay, well, the salary increase is Y percent. He said, well, okay, then I would like to ask for this Y percent salary increase and work as assistant manager as I work towards the manager promotion. And that was a successful negotiation. It didn't go exactly as he had initially intended, but he moved himself up. So I think it, when you hear no, don't get disappointed, just get curious. Yes. And you can, at this point, I think, bring up full compensation because you can negotiate for things far beyond salary. So flexibility, um, taking classes, uh, commute, right? They could pay for your Metro card. But one thing I would mention is it's not, I, I want this. It's how do you position this ask as a benefit to the business as well? So basically anticipate all the reasons why they'll say no afterwards, right? Well, we don't do work. We don't have flexibility here. Nobody's done it before, right? And so anticipate that. Well, what would you say in response? How would you make the case? Right, flexibility increases productivity, right? Or maybe speak to the fact that they don't feel confident that you'll, you know, maintain communication with them. So I'd like workplace flexibility, but I can, you know, we can work out a system where I'm transparent with my work. Maybe let's try it once a month. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's not just, I want full compensation. It's being specific about what you want and already anticipating the no. Yeah, and I would also just add that I think if you get a really quick yes, um, that may not be such good news because that may mean that you know you actually didn't ask for enough yeah. right because if they say yes right away then you may have left value on the table so to speak so um, no no is better than you think it is mm -hmm. yeah. so, so no is just the beginning uh, so and the, the research has shown and, and we know that there's this backlash idea that, that you brought about that you know you, 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 you there's certain perceptions that um, that you know that that don't help women get what they right. uh, what they want and the question is given that we're not going to reinvent or redo the structure of how things work um, is how how do how does the research and how does experience inform uh, women who want to negotiate into uh, leveraging or, or, or working around these these particular roadblocks significant mm. roadblocks that need to be addressed more fundamentally but given that we're having a hands-on approach we uh, you know, we can discuss ways in which this can, this can happen. Like, for example, how about asking in writing? Mm-hmm. Um, you mean asking over email or? Just start a negotiation yeah. in writing. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not a fan. I'm not a personal proponent of that. And I, if anything, I think the backlash effects could get magnified. I just think there's so much nuance that gets lost. Yeah. Um, in email, so I wouldn't. I, yeah, I'm not. I'm not a fan of that. I mean, again, getting back to the backlash issue, um, I think I would, you know, echo, you know, what's already what's already been said here, and particularly, um, also, you know, also what Lisa and what Claire just said about about how this uh, salary raise will benefit the organization. I think it is really key to think about how you're framing. Uh, the negotiation. I mean, my sort of take on the backlash effects and the catch-22 is again that um, uh, you know it is real, and many people have said, yeah, maybe women don't ask because they're making a very rational calculus that if they ask, they're you know they're not necessarily going to benefit from it. So I do think it is very real. Um, on the other hand, um, I don't think that the conclusion is then okay. So then let's not go negotiate. Um, I also don't think the solution is to also say to women, we'll just go to negotiate and then you'll, you know, you'll, you'll figure it out. But I think on a personal basis, I do think, uh, you know, obviously I think that people should be negotiating. I think that the way one frames the negotiation matters a lot. I also think that employers really need to think about how they're responding to men and women who negotiate. And I imagine many of you in the audience are employers, right? And so as you move up the, you know, rungs of your organizations, um, you know, thinking about, you know, how do you view people who negotiate? What types of assumptions do you bring? Um, to the situation. Um, you know, I actually did a study, Lisa and I were just chatting about it, where I found that um, men and women were, so on average, men were being offered lower salaries than women, but when, the, but when women brought explicit information that they were actually their family's breadwinner, they were treated exactly like the men were. Because it simply seemed that from the employer side, the employers had a set of assumptions about working women 
Um, and once they sort of knocked that assumption out, uh, the discrimination disappeared. So all that is to say is I do think the backlash effects are tricky. I think people need to be thoughtful about it. Um, I would absolutely agree with the framing issues that Lisa and, and Claire mentioned. But I don't think the conclusion is not to negotiate. And I really do think on the employer side, employers need to take responsibility, you know, and not just sort of raise their hands and say, okay, well, the squeaky wheel will get the grease. I mean, I do think employers have an important role to play here. And I hope, again, given that I'm sure many of you are in the position of being on the receiving end of negotiations, that that will be, um, you know, something that if you're not, I'm sure you're already thinking about already, but, you know, give more thought to how these, how these uh, conversations play out in your firm or your organization. So, um, I have found that in my experience, the place where gender bias is most sinister and most insidious is within myself. And when I have the thought that because I'm a woman, this is not going to work out for me, I set myself up for failure. And I have also found in my own experience, I'm not talking about anyone else's, that when I did negotiate poorly, I got a poor reaction. But when I negotiated well with the intention of reaching agreement, with the intention of being curious, with the intention of allowing for that no, there was room for a conversation, a relationship. And so um, this question of backlash uh, is something that I can't answer because I don't know if it really is real out there. Uh, but what I can say is that in my experience and one stories that I have heard, what people do to overcome this is with humor, with compassion, with lightness, and with, um, you know, with a willingness to really be in that relationship with the person that they're negotiating, vulnerable, open. I'll tell you an extreme story that I've heard. This is hearsay. Somebody who works for a California university system mm -hmm. happens to be a woman, African-American female professor. She went to negotiate for her pay, and she, you know, she has a light touch humor side, she sat down with her employer, who happens to be an older white man, and he said, now we're going to talk money. Just pretend that I'm white. <laughs> pretend I have a penis. <laughs> so now let's talk about money. So I, you know, this might not be the kind of thing that you can do. It might be a little too extreme for your taste. Mm -hmm. Another way to name the elephant and neutralize the elephant in the room it's just to call out what is, not, what is the really uncomfortable thing that is not being said. For example, you could say, now I know there's research out there saying that people don't like women who ask for what they want. And I'm willing to put my neck out here and have a conversation with you because I know that you value the work I do more than what, you, what preconceptions you may have about women who negotiate for what they want. So show up, be vulnerable, be open, be willing to say what's on your mind without creating accusation or blame. And I think uh, it is possible for women to overcome biases within themselves and outside of themselves. So Jamie, in your anecdote, you bring in an, an, important, uh, an, an important aspect, which is race. So uh, in the earlier panel, we saw some significant discrepancies mm -hmm. of uh, women of, of different races earning uh, cents of the dollar at a different rate. So I'm curious as to the extent to, to which the research has some bearing of this, on this and also some, uh, again, practical Im implications on, on this important question. I, I speak a little bit to the research, maybe not on yeah. um, you know, negotiation necessarily, but kind of backlash and perceptions of, of women. Um, so yeah, there is a lot of research, on, they call it intersectionality, right? What happens when you cross race and gender? And they're, they're basically, you know, one hypothesis is that sort of the more, um, you know, sort of stigmatized identities you have, the worse it's gonna be, right? So if you're both a woman and a racial ethnic minority, that's worse than having just kind of one of those 
those identities. But I, I think it's more complicated uh, from that. Some of the research I think is most interesting sort of shows that um, these things can offset each other. Uh, so basically what happens is people have certain stereotypes about um, women and men when it comes to, um, you know, sort of being expected to be warm and communal versus more agentic, right? So women are expected to be warm and communal, and men are expected to be more agentic and aggressive. But they also have stereotypes about, about races. Um, and so in particular, you know, a, a black African-American stereotype is sort of more aggressive and agentic as compared to an Asian-American type stereotype. And these things can offset each other. Um, so what there's some evidence suggesting is that actually for, you know, white women are sort of um, more likely to be penalized for being too aggressive and agentic relative to African-American women because being agentic and aggressive is at least, you know, consistent with one of the identities for an African-American individual but not a woman. Whereas for Asian women, when it were sort of both those stereotypes, you know, converge on being really warm and communal, well, they're likely to get penalized even more, right, relative to white women for, um, for behaving in that way. I don't know what everyone is thinking about me. I was born in South Korea. I'm an immigrant. Uh, people have asked me if I'm from China. People have asked me if I'm from Filipino. People have asked me if I'm from Japan. And you may individually have an idea of what it is to be a woman from one of those countries. I have no idea what that is. And the beautiful thing about having a human brain is that you can have the thought, the belief that you have about who I may or may not be, I can't do anything about that. And so um, I guess the point I'm trying to make is everyone is allowed to be, to think, and do as they are. And women can respect people's individuality to think and be. And oh, I mean, you may also have the thought, we can't let people do that. That's wrong. But. You can have that thought, right? I can't do any, I can't go inside your brain and fix your thought. I mean, that, that would be impossible. So the art of negotiation is about making a request. And the art of negotiation, I think, is also about being open to the possibility that you can think and say, do whatever you think and say in response to my request. I think the mastery part of negotiation is being willing to allow people to um, do and think and say whatever that may make me potentially feel uncomfortable. So I, I think, I guess the point I'm trying to make here at the, at the end is um, it boils down to self-mastery, right? And um, I kind of forget the original question, <laughs> but... Um, yeah, I, I think the more we're willing to be uh, open to other people's perceptions and be curious about it, we'll be uh, able to engage in the conversation in a proactive and productive way. Thank you. Thank you. So, so one of one of the uh, themes that came up in several of your of your uh, discussions was this idea of transparency mm -hmm. and yeah. also having information and preparing mm -hmm. yourself. Um, how, how do you achieve that and how, how do you, you know, how do you make that actionable and, and how does that transparency uh, work and help? Mm -hmm. um, so I'll talk about transparency with uh, peop your network and trying to figure out how much you should charge because you can do the research online but depending on what you do for a living, I mean, for example, I had a job where my title was Master of Ceremonies, nice. which was great on my business card because it was a conversation starter, but when you're trying to do market research, it's like, <laughs> what is that? Uh, and, and so what helped me, and I'll go on a little bit of a tangent before I get into uh, activating your network and being transparent about your salary. For a job like that, I sat down and I thought about, well, what are all the categories of the things that I do? How much of what I do is project management? How much of what I do is art direction or whatever it is? And so I looked at sort of the buckets of the things that I did and I looked up salaries that were commensurate with what's an art director with five years experience at a small company in New York City. And it's not a formula. It was just, again, giving me as much evidence as I could so when I made my case, I could at least justify how I came up with this certain number. But of course, then you have to ask real people. I would make it a goal. I would ask at least five people. 
people get at least five sources. So also when you go in to talk about your how much you're asking for, you can say, I spoke to five different people, one of whom was a recruiter. Right? So again, this helps inform you, but it also demonstrates to them that you know what you're talking about. And so a way that I activated my network to get them to be transparent is I thought about who do I know that is incredibly well networked themselves. So this is somebody I call a portal person. And so we, we all know these, this person. So you think about, all right, who is this person who seems to know everybody that I have some sort of six degree separation with them? And go to them first and say, I'm looking to figure out my salary. I've done a bunch of research. Do you mind if I'm gonna just give you a couple of sentences of what I'm looking for? Could you please pass it on to people in your network? And so this is where you would be explicit about, you know, again, art director, five years experience, uh, small company in New York City, because all of that context is what helps inform your salary. Um, and, and to present your salary too, or your research. So this is what I found. This is the range of what I found. Could you please pass this on? And so what that does is it makes it very easy for that person. They had to do no work. They literally copied and pasted and maybe sent it to people in their network that could help you or maybe just sent it to sort of their favorite group of people with the explicit point being, we should all do this. Even if you can't help, even if you barely look at this email, what it's signifying is that salary transparency can only help everybody. So all, you know, if I were to receive that email, I'll remember when it's time for me to negotiate, A, it's okay to talk about this stuff, and B, this is actually pretty strategic to try to tap into your network and leverage it in that way. Um, and also it can be a kind of um, social experiment for yourself. So, you know, when you're getting salaries from, from men compared to women, I, I'm curious what you, what you find, and that's something we actually have to remind the women in our network. We have an online network and, and they're all giving each other career advice. And so in the salary negotiation channel, uh, we have to jump in and remind them, make sure you're asking white men since they're the ones making the most money here. Mm -hmm. You know, at some point, this is kind of the blind leading the blind. Uh, and, and then everyone realizes, you know, and they're uncomfortable talking to the men also. You know, so there's a comfort in, in solidarity and in, in being marginalized in a way. So then that's another question of how do you get comfortable asking somebody who's, you know, important or whatever, you know, how much they make. And I would always ask the ballpark. What's the ballpark of what you make? Or here's the research I did. Am I off base? Right? So I don't think it's as simple as how much do you make? Or asking one person. Um, so it's sort of how can you be as creative and strategic as possible when you ask other people and please make it easy on them to help you. Help them help you. Yeah. I've actually used Ladies Get Paid uh, okay. uh, the channel mm -hmm. and I've gotten great um, information okay. and um, one of the people who spoke at a Ladies Get Paid event was a podcaster. Do you remember? I forget her name, but she she actually recorded the process of interviewing people mm -hmm. in her network. She went to her grandfather. She went to people who work in her industry, and she actually recorded the conversation she had with them. And she asked them, "What do you think I should get?" paid for the role that yeah. I do and it was about twenty to thirty thousand dollars than what she was making oh, really? at that time. So that was that was a really great mm -hmm. example of somebody who's really uh, just embodying that transparency, mm -hmm. not just for herself but for like everyone who was listening to that podcast. And so I think um, I think of negotiation as an act of leadership. So as Claire you know has done for us, I think in order for us to get transparency we have to model transparency and, and share hey you know I'm in this field and I, did, I literally had this conversation just the other day with another coach and she was telling me about what she's making. so I'm like yeah this is how much I make and we can have a conversation about it and you know the beautiful thing about it is that we can make as much as we like it's just how much we want Mm -hmm. And, and to the, your point of her, you know, being transparent about how she figured this out, that's not just asking how much do you make or am I off base with my ballpark. I'm curious how you discovered, you know, how did you do your market research? Because hearing that now it makes me want to ask, you know, my family members. Mm -hmm. um, and also I think when you start to feel uncomfortable about asking how much people make or sharing how much you make, then I would, I would implore you to think, well, to ask yourself why. Mm -hmm. Why do I feel uncomfortable? Is it rude? Why is it rude? You know, and so as you kind of like dig into that and lean into the discomfort, you may discover, 
would I rather say nothing because I'm uncomfortable? Is that I'm going to weigh that higher than making $20,000 more money, right? So that might be uncomfortable and you may agree with your rationale of why you don't want to speak up. But if that then means you're leaving money on the table because of your discomfort, then you're making a decision there. So one of the, one way in which this information can be ascertained is through um, networking, but not so much the networking through channels or emails, but also, you know, usually the most valuable information I uh, gather is within the organization, because it's, you know, you control for a lot of things that might explain salary differences, especially if there are several people with, a, with the same role. So I wonder whether both the research and, and uh, practical uh, uh, exper um, approaches have some type of insight as to the role that this informal networking plays um, not only in, in ascertaining information, and I'd love to know, aside, besides salary information, what, what, what other facts or factors are necessary to make the case for yourself and should also be included within this transparency um, uh, umbrella? And, um, and, and second, how, you know, to what extent do these informal relationships also affect the way we, we, we can effectively negotiate, because Jamie, you were talking about injecting humor and vulnerability, and I can imagine if you want, I can imagine how the conversation would go with somebody who's a stranger, basically, whom I only see at some kind of office uh, event versus somebody that I see more informally and that I spend time with. So there's different, and then there's negotiation within your, the, your, your team, uh, there's negotiation with a person who sets your salary. So I wonder the extent to which these informal relationships, which uh, could be labeled networking, but I'm thinking more about the intimate networking of, of, of work relationships, how, how that affects, I mean, whether there's research on it and, and how that affects the way in which we approach these particular problems. And then what's, what else should be brought into this whole transparency? Uh, thing. Mm -hmm. So lo lots of questions. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's a really good point. Um, and um, this general, uh, the role of these uh, uh, more informal networks, relationships at work, um, I think uh, too often in the research uh, we tend to use um, uh, sort of experimental methods where people are just, you know, okay, you're the bot, you know, you're the recruiter, you're the job candidate, you know, you do this artificial exercise, go negotiate, and let's see how, you know, the women versus the men do. Um, and I don't think that's obviously how it plays out in organizations. Um, so I do think that those, um, that the relationships and, and one's position in the network play a, a key role. Um, in fact, I think that, and, and that sort of gets to uh, the point that I was discussing about thinking about this issue not in terms of our one-off salary negotiation, you know, did I ask for 5,000 more when I was hired, but actually to think about negotiating one's career um, on a daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. Um, because I actually in many ways think of the relationships that you described um, as negotiations. Um, and so um, in my research, I found that often um, uh, very successful women, men as well, but very successful women um, actually do these types of career negotiations quite successfully. And they often negotiate um, for, for arrangements that aren't necessarily on the books. Right? They're not necessarily um, you know, something that one would know about just from reading the, the company manual, whatever the case may be. But they're, they're embedded within these relationships and they're, you know, they're sort of more specialized, we call these bending negotiations, and they're these more specialized negotiations that really then facilitate their career development. And, and these types of negotiations, again, um, are really, I think, only possible in the context of those relationships and only, only possible when one really has that kind of intimate knowledge of the organization and, and the individuals within the organization. Um, and ultimately, that's, that's um, of course, going to influence salary, right? I mean, that career advancement is going to go hand in hand um, um, with the salary. So I do think that, that, is, that, that the role of having those networks, developing those networks, and really thinking of negotiation, again, as something you do you know, every day, every week, every month, um, is a very um, important point. Yeah. I totally Just, agree with everything <clears throat> Julia shared. And uh, Catalyst, which is a non-for-profit that promotes diversity and inclusion in Fortune 500 companies worldwide, they put out a research called the Unwritten Rules of the Workplace, and they have found that uh, being part of an informal network is the key success metric for understanding and navigating the unwritten rules of the workplace, like who gets the hot jobs, 
who gets you know that committee seat and who are the decision makers who are the influencers who are the mentors and the champions uh, one of the things that is really key to imp uh, really important to remember is that when people make these decisions about who gets promoted who gets uh, a raise that decision will be made in a closed room closed door room where you're not going to be in it right so who are the players who will be in that room do you have a relationship with the people in that room in other words do you have a champion right you have somebody who will go to bat for you behind closed doors and uh, people often talk about mentorship, you know, who can give you that uh, strategic insight, the unwritten rules, the nuances of how these discussions are held in the workplace. But I think there's more to it than that. There's also uh, influencers, people who have the year of the key decision maker, right? And also uh, stakeholders who can be clients, who can be your family members who, who have a role in, um, who will be impacted by the decision that is made, whether that's a salary discussion, a work dis discussion. So I think it's really important to think about, you know, to your point, like think more strategically about who are my allies and how I can develop and lean on those allies to uh, negotiate my career success. I wanted to add just one caveat. I agree with all that, but there's this, um, you think about the research, there's one really interesting study, I'm gonna get the exact details wrong, but basically what they did was they looked at um, some women from an all-female college and some men from an all-male college, uh, and they tracked their uh, salary at their first jobs after graduation, and basically what they found was that the women earned less because their network had women in them, whereas the men earned more because their networks had men in them. Um, so I think one thing we need to be careful about is those informal relationships are really, really important, but you know, we all fall victim to what's called homophily. We like people who are like us. So if we're not thoughtful about it, what's going to happen is our informal network is going to be all women if you're a woman. It's going to be all men if you're a man. Um, and then when it comes to those people in the room, right, there are more CEOs named John, right, than there are female CEOs, right? So the chances are those decision makers are going to be men. They're less likely to, um, to be in your network. So, it, you know, it, those informal relations are really important, but it has to be really thoughtful and conscious that you're kind of Stepping outside your comfort zone, trying to cross those lines, um, you know, thinking about who are the powerful people who probably, you know, who may or, or may not look different from you, and, and being active in cultivating those those relationships. It's the same thing with um, research on mentorship and sponsorship. That can be really effective. That can really help people advance their careers, but only if your mentor or sponsor, right, is someone who's really powerful in the organization. Um, so it's important um, to use those networks, use those informal networks, but you know, not let it happen organically. Be really thoughtful and strategic about it at the same time. Mm -hmm. So this raises the question as to, I guess, from the uh, organizations, how do you create opportunities so that these uh, net networks or relationships can be created? And second, if you take the organization as it is, as, 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 you know, as an individual with agency, how do you uh, foster or create these connections? I mean, it's much easier to connect with somebody who's like you. Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is, well, how do you, uh, do you see certain opportunities? Do you, um, you know, if you take the, make the first move, what, how can you uh, create these uh, opportunities for yourself to uh, expand uh, or, or, or increase, a, uh, make your uh, network uh, more heterogeneous? I don't know what employers can do, but I can tell you what I teach all of my clients to do is, is to adopt the values-based uh, approach and always ask, how can I add value to you, to people that they want to connect with? So it's not just about what can I get from this relationship and can you help me? It's how can I add value to you and to your projects? So just changing subjects a little bit or, or directions. Uh, another another uh, finding from the, or, or in, um, insight from the earlier panel was this idea of the sticky floor. Mm -hmm. So I imagine that one of the things that uh, women want to negotiate in addition to increased salary is things are things like um, flexibility or, or negotiate opportunities. And, and I guess this relates to Julia's idea of you know, taking your job and your career as something that is being continuously negotiated. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what if, what, how, how do you go about negotiating something that is non-monetary? 
How, how do you leverage that? And is there, is there research on that? Is there, what, you know, usually when, when, when you think about negotiation, it's always salary, um, and there's certain stereotypes or certain expectations about what might happen in that negotiation. There's a certain give and take. But what if you, what if you just come out with something completely out of the box? And what if you come out with something that, um, and as I believe uh, Claire said, is not, even, is not even in the description of what the firm is about, which usually what happens is that we have these informal relationships, and I think, uh, Julie, you mentioned this earlier too, um, that m maybe, maybe you kind of like uh, uh, choose your own adventure, uh, choose your own adventure <laughs> type of thing when it comes to, um, uh, uh, to what your job is going to be like. How, yeah. how frequent is this? How, how do you do that? Does, is, is, is there research say anything as to what happens with these non-conventional ways of negotiating? Mm -hmm. Um, things and, and you know what, what can we what can we do about it? Mm -hmm. Can I answer your question with a question for yes, the rest yes. of the panelists? So so generally speaking, you know, research and negotiation, expanding the pie is always a great thing to do, right? If they can't give you more salary, maybe ask for a new computer, right, or, or something else like that. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know. I don't know. If there's any research on this, but I wonder a little bit about how that plays out in the context of of gender, where my intuition would be that you know. A man and a woman come to their boss, and this is a question for the other panelists, and they ask for more money. For the woman, they're more likely to say, well, we're not going to give you more salary, but we'll give you some flexibility because, of course, you're going to care about your family more than men do, right, stereotypically. And it, it actually might perpetuate the gender, the gender mm -hmm. stereotype. Um, that would be my concern. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, so there is definitely uh, research on what is called the flexibility stigma. Um, you know, and this, this flexibility stigma holds for both men and women. Um, in some ways, it's worse for men um, because uh, it's, it's sort of so counter to their gender role uh, negotiating, let's say, flexible work or more time with one's family. Um, so there certainly is research showing that, that, it, that you know, when you negotiate things like flexibility, it, it can, you know, you do run the risk of being stigmatized or, or discounted or you're not a serious player anymore. Um, on the other hand, as I said, um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, in my research I found that in fact negotiating, uh, you know, flexible arrangements are, are really have one way that very successful women facilitate their careers and they're able to do that successfully. So I don't think the jury's out on that. Um, we also know from the research, and this is going back, you know, many, many years, um, that people do negotiate what are called ideals or idiosyncratic deals. This is classic organizational behavior research, and typically the people who are most successful at doing that are the most valued employees, right? Not a surprise. If you're highly valued, you can, you can negotiate all sorts of things and you can get it, right? So I think in some ways it also just has to do with uh, your standing in the organization and, and making, you know, if you're, you know, if you're a high contributor, I think you do actually have a lot of latitude um, to negotiate, um, you know, a variety of, um, of arrangements um, um, for yourself. So there has, been, there has been some research around this issue. And then finally, um, I, uh, I've also found in my research that people do actually what we call shaping negotiations, that they do actually, through their negotiations, negotiate actual, not just uh, deals for themselves, but actual practices that end up influencing the organization, shaping the organization. Uh, we find that that tends to be more frequent among men than women, but that both men and women are engaging in these shaping uh, negotiations. To go off of that, um, so at, at our conference, we had a woman uh, on a panel who at the time worked for the New York Times, and she helped implement a better paid family leave policy. Mm -hmm. It's not what she did for a living, um, but what she, what she did was she got allies. To your point, she found other people in the organization, men, very much men included, um, and also asked around, has anybody else tried to do this? You know, first did her own research internally, uh, and then they did research on how to position it as a benefit to the business, and were any of the New York Times competitors, what were their policies? Mm -hmm. Because it's very expensive for a company to lose talent, right? So they need to be, you know, competitive. And perhaps these other, you know, publications didn't have good family leave policies. Well, that actually makes the case for why the New York Times should, so that they're a place that, you know, can attract good talent. So, so she made the case on multiple levels and went in there with a group of people. I mean, it wasn't like a, she didn't like stage a coup, but you know, she, it wasn't just her, so she wouldn't just be penalized. And it was to change the policy for the whole organization, though of course the impetus for her doing this was because she'd had a child. Uh, and now she works somewhere else, but she's left this legacy, which is, which is amazing. Um, so I love, I love what, her story. I think the answer to your question is that it's exactly the same. 
you um, bring the future focus, you know, what additional value will I bring to this organization? And to your point, if you are indispensable to the organization, you're a high contributor, and people know your um, value that you bring, I, I think the details would become uh, sort of uh, immaterial if you want to work from home, if you want to have a flexible work schedule, if you want to commute from, you know, I don't know, from both cities or whatever. I think um, if, it's, if it benefits the company, as uh, Claire said, if you can bring the benefit to the company, uh, the, the negotiations about how you do the work, where you do the work, details like that will just kind of fall into place. So one final question before we open it, uh, opening it, up, uh, open it up to the audience. So, um, so we get better with experience. And practice doesn't make perfect, but it helps. We don't have the opportunity to negotiate, at least your salary, this idea of negotiating your career every day helps. So how do we prepare, uh, can we prepare in a way that, uh, that increases our chances of uh, success? Absolutely. Practice on yes. your friends and family members. <laughs> Especially when I always tell my MBA students, we talk about um, persuasion more generally, and this idea that we want to start the data, but you got to pull in people's emotions. And so, you know, practice in situations where the stakes are low. You're trying to figure out where to go to dinner with your, your spouse or partner, and, you know, just try to like, use some of the techniques, you know, bring your evidence-based approach. Start by appealing to their emotions and do these kind of things. And just because, you know, it becomes comfortable, becomes familiar, you can laugh about it, but then you just get in the habit. Uh, well, I realized that I was an excellent negotiator when I practiced with the low stakes. Um, so I fly a lot, uh, and frequently I have to change my flight. Now, of course, there's like a major penalty, right? They, they charge you a ton of money when you change your flight. So what I'll do is I, I get on the phone and I try to negotiate with them. Uh, and so the first time I did this, I wasn't actively thinking this is my practice, my practicing negotiation, but I realized it after. Uh, and it was a woman on the phone. And so I talked to her about how I own a small business. Uh, and I, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I don't have much funds. My business is Ladies Get Paid. It's free to join, ladiesgetpaid.com, you know. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, I said, so what, what can you do? Is there anything you can do for me? And she said, I'll waive the fee, <laughs> you know. And that doesn't work all the time. Uh, but it showed me that it's possible. And it showed me that you just ask and you tell a compelling story. Uh, so that, I think about that a lot. Um, but that's to your point of, of negotiate when the stakes are low. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to Claire's point, there is opportunity, uh, there's opportunity abounds for negotiating. You go to a restaurant, you could ask for a different seat. You go to a hotel, ask for an upgrade, right? I used to do fundraising and I knew, one of my mentors is actually a sports lawyer and she found out that she was getting paid less than her male colleague just because he was a male who was married. And in her words, she went uh, thermonuclear and she negotiated and she got her pay adjustment. But before that, what she, what she did was she started asking for money on purpose. She started fundraising for charities that she believed in on purpose to grow her skill, to become more used to asking for money and hearing no. The more you get used to hearing no and saying no and asking for money, the more comfortable you will become negotiating for your own salary. Yeah, I'll just add one thing to that um, because my colleagues and I recently um, uh, conducted a couple studies about negotiation training. And interestingly, we found that when the training was sort of just focused on kind of the nuts and bolts tactics, it was a little bit of the rich get richer, so the men really benefited from that and the women didn't benefit so much in terms of the negotiation performance. But when we created the training such that it was that nuts and bolts negotiation tactics, plus um, you know speaking towards the, the larger why why this is important you know how you know how the other side is likely to view this sort of these larger psychological issues plus you know these kind of nuts and bolts tactics how to negotiate in that case it worked very well for both uh, for both men and women so I would say just you know the tactics and all that are great but I think women also benefit as well from these more psychological mindset issues around negotiating at least that's what we found when we tested these different types of negotiation training Great, so why don't we open it up for questions? Yes. Um, so I have a question about oh, one second, there's gonna be a microphone. Yep. Thank you, uh, this was terrific, I thank you. And we talked a bit about 
salary negotiations once you've been at a firm and leveraging what you've accomplished and the value you've added. I'm curious when you're looking for a new role, how that might change and what you would recommend in terms of negotiations. For example, if they ask you what salary you are looking for, are you negotiating against yourself? What's a better way to do that potentially? And also, um, if a recruiter tells you this is the salary, are you willing to take it and it's much lower than what you had been earning? Or is there an openness to starting a negotiation later or will you be perceived as having agreed to one thing and then asking for something else? And as an example, a friend of mine got a job offer, negotiated to try to get a higher salary, and actually the offer was rescinded from her. And frankly, I don't think that would have happened with a man. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious about your thoughts. Mm -hmm. I'll speak to the first part of the question, which is do you, this kind of game of chicken that we, we often play of who says the number first when they ask you how much do you want to make. Why don't you just point to the market research? Right? I talked to five people, X, Y, and Z, and here's, uh, here's what I found. And I would mention the range. I, I think people can, I've heard otherwise, where you pick one number. I would say in the market research I did, you know, it was from X to Y, uh, Y obviously being the top performer. I'm a top performer. You tell that star method story of what you've done for your past firm. And so you know, I would be asking for the top part of the band, you know, this pay band, as it's called. Um, so that way it's not, you don't look greedy, you just look well researched. You're mentioning the fact that you're a top performer and you can kind of say it lighthearted, you know, well of course I'd be asking for the highest part of the bit, you know, so that's because where. you're confident. Right, you're confident, but you can also kind of say it, you know, it's sort of just obvious. Uh, but I'll let somebody else speak to this offer being rescinded, which probably meant it wasn't the right place for her to be working anyway. Hmm. Uh, go ahead, no, no, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I would agree that if uh, the recruiter asks you, is this the range that works for you, and you say yes, and you continue with the conversation, and then you ask for a different number, then um, it's plausible for them to think that, oh, this person agreed to this number, now they want something different. So I don't know, I can't speak to whether that's because this person was a woman, but I would, um, I would just tell them what you want from the beginning. And if it doesn't work, then just let it go. It wasn't meant to be. One, one thing I'll mention, so headhunters uh, tend to take 10 to 20% off of your salary. So if a company is saying, oh, we can only afford this amount, but they're paying a headhunter to find you, they certainly had more money. They're just paying it to the headhunter instead of to you. Um, one thing I would mention is you say yes, you take the salary, and then once you've shown your worth, uh, you, you know, you have some wins. And I would always try to negotiate once you've had a big win. At least go in there and start the conversation. And I might mention, you know, I agreed to a salary when I came here, but I, I understood that it was below market. Here's the research I did. But I took the job because I really want to be here. And I love it. But, I, but again, you're acknowledging, but I know that it's below market rate. I still said yes, but I'd like to talk about when it's time for the raise, how can we close the gap? So you're still acknowledging that you know that you were underpaid. You're mentioning the market research. You're acknowledging your appreciation for the company. I mean, you're giving rationale to why you said yes, but you're also making it future focused and make them give you tangible, you know, here's what you need to do, explicit. How do you define success? You know, get them to give you as much information as possible so that you can then leverage it. Yes. in writing a point was brought up about a request in writing well I, I don't think it would be uh, a good idea to just send an email to your supervisor and say I want to meet with you concerning a salary raise but uh, I think it might be a good idea to document your accomplishments either prior to to the conversation about salary increases or immediately thereafter, as our, we discussed the following. This way, mm -hmm. you have documented your accomplishments. Um, I have a CPA, uh, I have a CPA as well as, as a legal license, and one thing in the accounting profession is, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and after every meeting, write down what was said right. also. And you could even send it backwards. This is what we discussed, I just want to confirm. 
Absolutely, and I, uh, I recommend doing what we call a brag book. So throughout the year, if you're getting emails praising you, client loved your work, your manager said great job, whatever it is, I, I take a screenshot and I put it in this, this folder on my desktop. So also when you go in to make your case, it's not just you documenting what you did, but it's showing evidence. It's a testimonial from somebody else. So don't just take my word for it, you know, take John's. Uh, so that's, you know, evidence is, is everything. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can I share one story about that? I did a workshop uh, and uh, this <laughs> attendee who works in corporate real estate, she told me the story that I have been retelling every time because it's important. She found out through the grapevines that her male colleague who had the same job as her was making 20% more than her. And so she realized this is something that needs to be addressed. She went to her manager they had a conversation and she asked an open-ended diagnostic question. She said, you know, what accounts for this difference? And the manager said, oops, sorry, mm -hmm. my bad, I'm going to fix that. She did not put that in writing. Two yeah. weeks later, he quit the firm. Oh, oh, no. yeah. So That's as you said, know. you're right. She yeah. didn't put it in writing, so it didn't happen. So if yeah. you have a meeting, if you have a conversation, please do document it. Yeah. Hi, I have two questions actually. The first is just sort of looking around this room and seeing that we're, we're a multi-generational crowd. If you think there are any differences in negotiating outcomes or in uh, preparing for negotiation uh, when you're at different stages in your career or at different ages. So for example, um, getting your first job versus making that mid-career transition versus maybe looking for where you're going to uh, retire from. Mm -hmm. And the second mm -hmm. is whether there's any research or um, knowledge of the differences in people who come from leadership programs or out of pipeline uh, programs in terms of um, their uh, positive outcomes to negotiation. Because maybe they have credibility or a greater network or any of those. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, interesting questions. Um, so in terms of the first question, I think that's a fascinating question. And um, there has not been a much research look comparing um, by age and stage. I actually think that uh, negotiating retirement would be a fascinating topic to study. Um, I, I don't know that it has been studied yet, but it's, it's not my main area. So I think that could be very interesting to look at, um, speaking of uh, you know negotiating different arrangements um, that could work for different people. Um, you know, I will say that um, I uh, recently um, did a study that involved surveying CEOs, uh, CEOs primarily from Texas, actually, because I was collaborating with somebody in Texas. Um, and granted, we had a pretty small sample, and then once we, you know, there were very few women in the sample. But um, I will say I was really surprised because I was thinking, okay, these CEOs, average age, I think the average age was about 50, late 40s, early 50s, very you know, highly experienced um, combination of CEOs and then also business owners. And so we you know, asked them all about you know, their feelings about negotiation, their propensity to negotiate, how, important, how much they view negotiation as part of their jobs, you know, all these kind of standard questions we ask. And I was thinking, we're not gonna see any gender effects here. I mean, it's just, these are, these are CEOs, right? So why, why, you know, their experience, they're, they're middle age, they're, you know, these, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna get what we see when we run a study in the lab at our universities. Um, and in fact, we did find very similar patterns <laughs> um, among these CEOs. We also found that among these CEOs, to speak a little bit to your second point, that the male CEOs were much more likely to have reported that they had, had some type of formal negotiation training than the female CEOs. Um, so, um, so, so I think it's a topic that should be studied more, um, but I, I, again, when I have looked at it a little bit, I was surprised to see that how that it actually didn't matter as much as I would, just my intuition would say. In terms of your second point, um, again, there hasn't been a real systematic study of people coming out of, let's say, leadership or exec programs versus non. It'd be a little tough also to study because you get such selection effects in terms of who selects themselves into those programs. Um, but again, as I said in my research, we have looked at training, and, and I do think that you know, when women are doing negotiation training, they're really, I do think also having that psychological component is very helpful. Men, again, don't seem to need that. They've had so many years of socialization to be agentic and assertive that I, I don't think they really need that. You just throw them some tactics and they're good. So that would be my response to the second point, yeah. 
I guess just, just one thing, it's a pragmatic thing to look out for. It's, it's certainly an issue in um, academia. It might not be in legal profession, but you know, just one thing to look out for is salary compression. So there's often sort of this tendency where you get this new job, you're excited about it, you negotiate for yourself, you get a great, great salary, and then what you don't realize is, you know, at least some companies will just kind of keep people moving along, whereas the market is changing and as new people come in, right, they're actually getting higher salaries and it creates this inequity. So just don't think of it as this one-shot thing that you do need to kind of keep on top of it and kind of re renegotiate when you have those big wins or at those critical points throughout your career, particularly if you're not changing jobs. Mm -hmm. Do you ever um, recommend that people get other jobs to negotiate, mm -hmm. like get another offer? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The more alternatives you have, the more leverage you have. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't recommend, you know, going out and, I mean, you need to do it ethically, right? I mean, I wouldn't recommend misleading people to then, um, you know, to then uh, go back and just use it. I mean, I would do it in an ethical approach, but I think you should always be uh, working on your leverage, right? And you should always be in a position where, uh, you know, you can at least say, oh, you know, there's interest, you know, this other firm has expressed interest in me. Or abs I mean, that's sort of one of the main findings about negotiation is the stronger your alternative, the more power you have in the negotiation, you know, across the board. Yeah. And when you bring it to them, you know, if you want to stay, you express that you want to stay, but you can always ask them, if you were in my position, what would you do? Right. Although be prepared for them to say, I mean, Walk, yeah. right. They I may mean, just say, well, you should leave. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah. you want to use it wisely. So I would only really, you know, you know, do it, if you want to do it in sort of a hard way, I would only do that if you are, in fact, mm -hmm. look, you know, happy to go. Or you can do it in a softer manner of just, you know, a way to demonstrate your value in the market and that there's interest in you and other places have expressed interest in you and, and to use it strategically. Yeah. And I'd also go back to the point about documenting it. If you're getting those requests from other people, like, you know, you, you document them and you, you find ways to let your boss know in a casual way. If you, I just recently got asked to do something that I didn't really want to do, but it's kind of a prestigious thing. And so I went to my department chair and I talked to him about it. Do you think I should do this? I didn't really want to do it, but at least then he knows, right? That like, yeah. I got this thing. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much. This has been extremely uh, helpful and informative.